Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the midweek Bible class, Second Samuel. Why don't we open with a word of prayer, shall we? Uh, Father, we thank you for the privilege we have tonight to study your word. It is indeed a privilege, one that we should be blessed by and actually consider uh, the honor we have of looking into a passage of scripture with some depth. Uh, Father, we always want it to be more than an academic exercise, though. We pray that you would speak to us as to what we need for our own lives as we interact with our sons and daughters, our mothers and fathers, our friends and neighbors. In the end, we pray that your son Jesus will be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this past week, uh, seven of the teaching pastors all went to Denver Seminary to study, and uh, I had the privilege of uh, studying with uh, five of our team under a, a professor named Craig Blomberg, uh, The Parables of Jesus. And uh, he's a renowned New Testament scholar, uh, well-read really across the world. And uh, Pastor Nathan and Pastor Jim studied under a renowned professor of apologetics. And uh, while I was there, I was like pinching myself. It's like, I get to study at a level of depth that, you know, it's just unprecedented. And it's just a, a beautiful thing. And one of the reasons we have a class like this is to translate that down because we all don't have the opportunity to go away to seminary somewhere, but that you can say, no, I want to learn something. I want to gain something. I want to stretch from what I knew before. And so that is really uh, why we are here. Now, I always like at the beginning of a class just to give a quick introduction of who you are. And I like to do this because there could be somebody here that you find interesting and you may, oh, I want to meet that person later. And that's great. That's awesome. So to go through very quickly um, your name and something that perhaps most people don't know about you. So your name and something that perhaps most people don't know about you. Um, I'll, I'll start off to give an example. Uh, my name is Steve Tomlinson. And uh, what most people don't know about me, unless you've been listening, listening very carefully, is that my great-grandpa founded a Pentecostal denomination called the Church of God Cleveland. And you can find them all over the world. Uh, and he was their first, what they call, general overseer. And uh, that's kind of cool. He was present at the turn of the century at the Azusa Street revivals and things like that. And uh, that's a little bit of a novel. So let's start with you, Wilson. Um, Wilson Wilmot and my wife, Mary Ann. And um, since we've been married 35 years, we've been scuba diving all those years. Got about 500 dives. Wow. That's amazing. My wife's up to like 65. <laughs> I'm Marianne, and uh, I don't know. Most people don't know. Uh, my first pet's name was Pussy Willow. <laughs> <laughs> you are absolutely right. I did not know that. What was Pussy Willow? A cat? A cat. Okay. I Ruben? I was five, so. Well, my name is uh, Ruben. I like uh, playing the guitar. Okay. Right. My name is Rocco. I'm retired. And, uh, well, great news. Retired. And, uh, and you're making good use of your time. You're in a Bible study. Good for you. <laughs> Okay, great. <laughs> Jerry? My name is Jerry, and my youngest daughter has a unique distinction of having four twin sisters. Oh. Wow. My name is Bill, and my youngest daughter just saved someone's life a couple of months ago. She's a nurse. So she did CPR and saved someone's life. That's excellent. Excellent. My name is Henry. Uh, 
playing tennis while it's going to be raging. Great, great. I want to play more. Remember, I got there from Philippines uh, for snorkeling. I'm going tomorrow. Wow. Just go right down the row. Now let's go with the back row and move across. <laughs> Were you at Iron Man at all, the men's thing? Yes, I was. Did you hear Adam Durso's comment? Yes. How many siblings do you have? I have four brothers and three sisters. Big family. Yeah, my name is Jim. I like to golf, but I used to skydive. My name is Steven. Uh, uh, I love to do Lego stuff. My name is uh, Carlos. I'm also Puerto Rican, but I actually learned how to speak Tagalog. Uh, my wife is Filipino. I've been in the Filipino community since I was 14. I actually learned Tagalog before I learned Spanish. <laughs> you know, I'll pause right there because I, I led you all in, in something. Adam Durso was a speaker at Iron Man, and in the passage we had, David is mentioned to have multiple wives that he preached on. And he said that, he said, the reason they had multiple wives back then is they didn't have a Puerto Rican wife like my own, who's sufficient <laughs> completely. <laughs> anyway, it was a very funny comment. <laughs> uh, my name is Russell. I like guitar music, but I also uh, been married for 50 years. Anyway. That's great. Okay, you got either one of you. Okay. She say porches? Porches. And so far, I have broken five bones in my body. Wow. Okay. No more. What were you studying in the University of Kentucky? Uh, finance. Okay. <laughs> Met your husband, doesn't matter. <laughs> my name is Rosa, and um, my, when I was little, my dad didn't want me to go to school just yet, even though it was time for me to start school, because he felt that I was too little. So he made my aunt homeschool me and start second grade. <laughs> Did you feel like you fit in immediately when you went in? Yes. Oh, good. That worked all right then. My name is Sue. I'm from China. I came to the United States in 1991 with my then husband. Then I divorced in 1999. I have two grown up daughter, uh, Yale and Dana. A lot of people pray for my family. <laughs> yes. Wayne and Barbara bring us home. I'm Wayne, and I'm madly in love with my wife, Barbara. <laughs> if you guys haven't picked that up yet. <laughs> and that we didn't know that? You're supposed to be something we don't know about you. Well, hey, now you know, so. <laughs> well, then at least Barbara can say something we don't know about you, Barbara. About me? Actually, I can talk Nathan. I'm one of ten kids. A big Irish-Italian family. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for, for sharing. I know for you guys watching online, that was probably un inaudible for you. Um, here's the thing. Um, you notice the camera is going. We do film this every Monday night, and uh, Lord willing, providing it works. And it's able to be watched on the church's webpage uh, or church Facebook page at a later time. And so if you have any interest, like you miss a, 
uh, class and you want to watch it, or if you want to go back in time, we have taught every book in the New Testament. Um, we have taught a number of books in the Old Testament, and uh, you can dig back into the archives and... Uh, I don't, I don't know if everything's up there, but there's a good number of things up there that you can uh, check in on. The other thing is if you've never taken a class, a uh, Bible class before, we do go in at a pretty, you know, deep level, but we're hoping to be accessible to everyone. And so, you know, feel free to ask a question uh, about something that may be coming up. Um, I do actually have the nerve to believe that you might learn something. Thus, we have quizzes every single class. We don't hand those quizzes in. They serve one simple purpose, to help us learn and for me to have an opportunity to mock Wayne from time to time. <laughs> yes, because uh, he is often our A student. You know, he does very, very well. Um, but the whole point of a class is, yes, it's to learn our Bibles, and I hope to stretch us. But even as I prayed, I'm hoping that as we go through a passage, that there will be something that will speak to you that is about something I need, that the Holy Spirit says, hey, you, this is for you, listen up. Now, when we're going through an Old Testament book like 2 Samuel, what kind of genre of literature is 2 Samuel? Somebody help me. Narrative. It's narrative, exactly, which means not everything we're reading is God commanding us, do this. What it is doing is it's just filming what happened. Sometimes we do pick up very positive examples that we can apply to our lives. Other times we pick up examples that we don't want anything near our life um, because of just the foolishness of what is going on in the passage. And so uh, I think there will be a lot of fun moments. And I did not hand out a syllabus today for one very simple reason. I forgot to print it up. So let me just tell you uh, very simply, we're going to meet on Monday nights pretty much all the way up until roughly March 15th. That'll be the end of this class. We'll finish 2 Samuel. And I want to finish it by then because on March 18th, a bunch of us fly to Israel. And uh, I didn't want to have like one chapter left when I came back. So we will complete 2 Samuel by uh, the uh, middle of March. Now, let's go over a quiz. And then when we're done with the quiz, our brother Nathan has a special announcement that I want to uh, have you have the opportunity to hear about. So, first question. The book of 2 Samuel is written by... Uh, Samuel the prophet, A, B, it's anonymous, C, written by David, D, written by Jonathan. The true and best answer is B, B. Now, why would we with confidence know that Samuel did not write this, even though it has his name? He's dead. He's dead. <laughs> What's the beginning of A Christmas Carol, written by Dickens? He's dead. J Jacob Marley was dead. Dead as a doornail, whatever that means. <laughs> that's, that's a paraphrase. But uh, yeah, he's gone. And same thing with Jonathan. He's gone. Um, David does say a lot of things, but he's not credited to be an author. Okay, number two. The period of time the book covers is about 1010 to 970, 1200 to 1100, 859 to 810, 1050 to 950. Now, because I wrote some stuff on the board, yeah. Yeah. I hope you got this right. <laughs> but the best answer is D. The best answer is D. Um, you know, A is close, not quite. But it is, it is if you look to the nuance of it, yes, it is... It is A. Yeah, in fact, in fairness, I would give you A and D in terms of what Second Samuel covers. The whole what I'm what I'm meaning by the previous number is the all book of Samuel, meaning first and second. Um, so that helps. Okay, number three. The principal characters of Second Samuel are 
Samuel, Saul, David, Nathan. So did you go for Samuel, Wayne, on that? Samuel's dead. Yeah, very good. Samuel's dead. Saul's dead. Saul's dead. Very good. David? David. Not dead. You're putting your money on David. Yeah, I think David's a wise one. And Nathan shows up. So if you put David and Nathan, God bless you. I mean, he's not a principal character, but he is definitely there on one of the most important conversations in the book. Number four, the book of 2 Samuel in the Septuagint is called. Now, supplemental question. What in the world the Septuagint is? What is that? Somebody help me? 70-something. What was that? 70-something? Yeah. Okay, what in the world does that mean? Seventy. <laughs> Anyone know? It's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, credited, kind of legendary, to 70 scholars and dates around 200 B.C., give or take. Um, and so this is an important document because it is one of the earliest translations of the Bible that we have. And so when the, the translators are trying to, you know, they usually are translating from the Hebrew text called the Masoretic text, which is a very accurate text. But when they're looking for alternative renderings, they read the Septuagint, which is a translation of the Hebrew text. And so if you look in the bottom of your Bible, you'll frequently see the word Septuagint and it has an alternative reading. So in the Septuagint, there are some little variances, and one of them is they call these books uh, 2 Samuel, A, B, Book of the Kings, C, The History of David, D, The History. So the Septuagint calls these books, and here's the answer, the Book of the Kings. I'm not expecting any of you to know that, but now you know a little piece of trivia. The Septuagint calls it the Book of the Kings. We sometimes... Uh, abbreviate the name Septuagint with three letters, just the Roman numerals LXX, just means 70, because that's the nickname of the translation based on the supposed 70 translators. Okay, number five. In 2 Samuel, David dances, dies, commits adultery, counts as fighting men. You know, he doesn't die yet. He's going to die in 1 Kings. He comes close. We get his last words. Not quite his last words, but it's, it's like listed as the last words. But um, he definitely dances with all his might. We're going to get that in uh, about two weeks. Um, when he brings the temple, uh, excuse me, brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Um, unfortunately, he does commit adultery. Um, you can probably guess who he commits it with. Anyone know the name? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Yes. And uh, last one, D, he does count his fighting men. And a prophet named Gad says, uh, 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 you shouldn't have done that, which is kind of interesting. It's a fascinating passage, but we're not going to get to that passage till March. So you'll live on the edge of your seat wondering why it's such a big deal that he counted his fighting men. Okay, last one. Which phrases are from 2 Samuel? A, don't I mean more to you than ten sons? B, the Lord has sought a man after his own heart. C, you are the man. D, oh my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. E, I will become even more undignified than this. Okay, A. No, no. 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 you know who said that? How can I? And it was about Hannah, you know, because she really, 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 really wants a baby, to which How can I says, don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? And she says, not so much. <laughs> I really want a baby. Um, and God gives her one. What's her baby's name? Samuel. Samuel, excellent. B, the Lord has sought a man after his own heart. Is that in first or second? First. It's in first. Who said it? 
Hannah's baby when he's grown up. Samuel. C, you are the man. This is 2 Samuel, uttered by the prophet Nathan, right after Nathan tells him a sad, tear-jerking story about somebody who had lots of sheep, but goes to the neighbor, to the little itty-bitty sheep that was the family pet, and slaughters it for the company. To which David said, whoever did this is going to die. And Nathan says, well... You're the man. And it was a metaphor, of course, for taking away Bathsheba. Okay? D. Oh, my son Absalom. Is that in First or Second Samuel? It is in Second Samuel. It is near. It's like kind of in the middle. It's a very sad, sad passage. Um, Samuel, excuse me, Absalom had causes a revolution, really. Um, civil war, I should say, not revolution. And um, he ends up dying in it, and, and David is so broken to lose his son. And the last one, I will become even more dignified than this. Is that first or second Samuel? It is second Samuel. And what is David doing to make himself undignified? He's dancing with all his might with just a linen loincloth. <laughs> yes, in his underwear. <laughs> um, and it is Saul's daughter, Michal, who says, My, how the king dignified himself today in front of all the maidens of Israel. To which David says, I will become even more undignified than this in the worship of my God. And it's a very powerful uh, statement. And uh, what I want now is our brother Nathan to come on up and tell us about an exciting program that's coming up. And come in front of the camera so they can see you in television land. Okay. <laughs> now, hopefully you can hear me well. I've been battling a bit of a sinus infection since we went on the trip. Um, but have you ever encountered a person or maybe a family member who said, well, if God's so good, why so much evil? Why so much suffering? Or if God's all-powerful, can he make a rock so big that he can't? Lift it. Or how about this? If God is real, why doesn't he make himself a little bit more obvious? Have you ever encountered anything like that? Well, I'm asking you these questions because this coming month, beginning the first Wednesday of February, we are going to start an apologetics class. Now, all apologetics means is defense, apologia, the defense of the faith. And what this is going to be is a class where we talk about good arguments. I'm not talking about being quarrelsome but arguments for God's existence, and maybe give you some practical tools to share your faith. So if you've ever had these hard questions asked to you by your family member, a co-worker, a friend, or maybe a stranger, and you're saying, hey, I want to strengthen my own faith, I want to be able to win unbelievers, and maybe even change the culture a little bit, then this is the class for you. And it's going to be about eight weeks. Uh, you're going to have to put on your thinking cap, it's gonna, uh, put it on real tight, because we're going to go through some things, but it will be accessible. Uh, so it's, what I'm calling it right now is reasonable and relational faith. And we're going to learn how to use relationships and reason mm -hmm. to win people, to strengthen our own faith, and to change culture. So just to clarify, it's going to be meeting in this room right mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. on Wednesday evenings, starting... First week of February? First week of February. Okay. And you guys are the first to publicly hear about it. But this has been uh, a passion of uh, Pastor Nathan's to give folks in the church an opportunity to know why we believe. Um, because, let's face it, this is our world. Uh, our kids ask questions that we don't know the answers to. And you'll have an opportunity in the class to bring up some of your kids' questions. You know, if they have some good ones from a teacher or a professor, um, we go to our resident staff egghead, and uh, Nathan will give what he knows. And if he doesn't know the answer, he'll look it up. Yeah. <laughs> and if you think Steve's quizzes are hard, wait. Just wait. Well, you got to freak I, I, them I, I, out I'm now. kidding. I'm kidding. It's a joke. <laughs> Don't do that. Thank you, Brother okay. Nathan. Well,
Yeah, uh, we're, we're thinking 7:30. Uh, uh, if you want to get here about seven-ish and have some, I'll have some cookies or something. Uh, that'd be great. But uh, following Steve's lead, I don't want to leave you without. But uh, we broadcast it as well. We haven't ca- crossed that line. We yet, haven't crossed the line yet, but he, uh, he may. He may record it. We'll see. I think it'll be a lot of fun. So 7:30 to nine-ish. It's an hour and a half. Class. Yes. Okay. So oh, it's uh, the whole the whole idea though was once again. People have so many questions, and how many venues in the church? Let's say you're in a small group, and everyone pools their ignorance in a small group, and they're like, well, I don't really know the answer to that, you know? And so maybe somebody writes a letter to me or some, one of the pastors, and this is just to give people tools by which you're kind of equipped yourself to answer some of these things. Yeah. And it's not even that you have to learn everything verbatim, but you're learning the process of argumentation. Did, did you guys ever watch My Cousin Vinny? Oh, yeah. Okay, it's one of my favorite movies, but Vinny, that great scholar, he's dealing with a prosecutor who's presenting a case which seems insurmountable. So he takes out a credit card and he says to the two guys wrongly accused of murder, he says, this is what your prosecutor is doing. He's building a case. He's telling you what's, uh, what they've discovered, the dimensions of it, and it looks really strong. It looks like a brick. But you turn it sideways, and it's paper thin. And what apologetics does is looks at what seems to be the bricks out there to which we go, can we really believe? Is there really a God? And then you find out there's more evidence for theistic thinking or that there is a God than there is on the opposite side. And so... It'll be a fun class, and you better keep it light enough that people can learn. No, I, it, it'll, it'll be accessible. And by the way, the, most people, if they lose their faith, they lose it about their senior year in high school or their freshman year in college. So if you have kids or grandkids uh, or, or know some people, younger people that would be interested in something like this, sign them up. Let's get, or sign yourself up so you can reach out to them. All right. Thank you, Brother Nathan. We are grateful for you. Okay, let me just give you a quick rundown now of a timeline concerning what's going on in the book of First and Second Samuel. Because here is a great thing for you just to have a handle. How many years, roughly, did David, uh, was he king before Jesus? 1,000. You got that in your head, you're in good shape. So here's the breakdown. So from 1050 B.C. to 1011 B.C., remember we count down when we're looking at B.C., here is Saul's reign. Um, then, around 1025 B.C., David is anointed as king. Now, this is a secret anointing. It's at Jesse's house. He's not king yet, but he will be. But it is God's uh, announce, annun- uh, excuse me, announcement that David will eventually be king. Then, around 1020 B.C., about five years after this, David has his most famous fight. He kills Goliath, the Philistine giant. Then, at 1011 B.C., now we're in 2 Samuel, Saul dies. Um, And at 1011 B.C. to 971 B.C., David is king of Israel. So again, simply put, about a thousand years before the time of Christ, David is king. So um, that just kind of gives you uh, a head start. When it comes to this book, we know this with confidence. It was finished sometime after the events of 2 Samuel. We, we, we don't know exactly when this book was completed, but we know also that Samuel wrote part of it, part of the first section, that it contributes with uh, words from Saul, with words from David, words from Nathan. But somebody is putting this all together, a narrative, who we don't know who it is. But he's wanting to preserve the history of Israel. And in the New Testament, we read from the Apostle Paul that these things are written that we can learn. And we're learning from their mistakes. We're learning from what they get right, what they get wrong. So with that in mind, we, uh, I want to show you just a few little maps before we uh, dig into our text. So here is a map of... Uh, You see here, David's kingdom at the beginning of his reign, 
and David's kingdom at the end of his reign. Now, if you can see the color distinction, here's the Dead Sea, here's the Sea of Galilee, here is David's kingdom at the beginning of his reign. Now, when I say the beginning of his reign, that is after there's this little civil war that we're going to start reading about tonight. Um, it's after that, that's his kingdom. However, as his kingdom advances, God brings him great victory, and this whole green area becomes his kingdom. And his son, Solomon, is going to take it all the way towards Egypt and all the way to the Euphrates River up there. So that's just seeing, you might say, the perspective of what is ultimately happening. Now, a couple other things I want to tell you about. Right around here is uh, Ziklag, which is where we're going to learn a little bit more about that tonight. But that is where David was hiding in the Philistine territory. And when they come back from, they were going to fight with the Philistines against Israel. But then the Philistine king said, no, no, we don't trust you. Go back. And they went back to Ziklag. But tonight, David is going to move from Ziklag, which is a ruin, to Hebron, right over here. Hebron is 19 miles south of Jerusalem. And the civil war that's taking place is going to be, those troops are going to be from this area here, Mahanaim. Now, what's interesting about this name, there's a whole bunch of Korean churches named that name. I don't know why. It is a, a, a town in ancient scripture, but there's one right near us. Uh, uh, when you're on your way to this church, you pass it. Mahanam uh, Church, it's a Baptist church. Um, there's one in Huntington. For whatever reason, the Korean community likes to name a lot of their churches that name. I don't know the answer. If somebody here is Korean can tell me that, you can explain that to me. <laughs> um, but that would be perhaps helpful someday to learn. So here is um, just a run back in history. So when we were together last time, before Christmas, way, way long ago. Last year. Yes. <laughs> um, there was going to be a fight, a battle right over here. And this is where Gibeah and the uh, uh, Philistines were all meeting. This is ultimately where Saul dies and his son Jonathan. So David goes up to fight with them, but somewhere along the line, uh, the king uh, who really loves David from uh, Gath, he's with the other uh, Philistine kings, and they're like, why do we have an Israelite? going to battle with us against the Israelites. I said, as soon as we get there, he'll turn on us. Well, the Philistine king is convinced, oh no, David's a good guy, he'll, he'll support us. And why did this Philistine king think David was on his side is because David told him lots of lies. That you know, The king would say, David, where have you been going? Oh, I've been going around here and beating up Israelites. And so the king would go, good for you, David. But in reality, he's going down here killing Amalekites. Uh, very, very different. And so what happens, though, they tell David, go home. So David goes home to Ziklag, and when he gets there, what does he find? The city is in ruins. Everybody has been taken captive by the Amalekites, which is a people that live in this area. So the people, his soldiers, his fighting men, are so depressed, they decide, I think we're going to stone David. And, and David, we read this in the passage, he found strength in his Lord, his God. And then he asked the Lord, should I go after the Amalekites? Will I be successful? And the Lord says to him, go, David, you will be successful. So he goes down, captures everything. No one was lost. Everyone gets their families back. But they come back to Ziklag, which is a smoldering ember now, because it's been burned to the ground. So in our text tonight, this is where he's going to say, Lord, should I move back into Israel now that Saul is dead? Nobody's pursuing him anymore. And the Lord said yes, and he's going to end up in Hebron right here, um, which again is roughly 19 miles from Jerusalem, uh, to give you uh, a little perspective. So, let me see if I have any other maps here. Oh, 
that'll cover us for now. So let's go to our text. And let me get to the front of it. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to read the first chapter. After the death of Saul, David returned from striking down the Amalekites and stayed in the Ziklag two days. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he came to David, he fell to the ground to pay him honor. Where have you come from? David asked him. He answered, I have escaped from the Israelite camp. What happened? David asked. Tell me. The, man, the men fled from the battle, he replied. Many of them fell and died, and Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. Then David said to the young man who brought him the report, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, the young man said, and there was Saul leaning on a spear with the chariots and their drivers in hot pursuit. When he turned around and saw me, he called out to me and said, what can I do? And I said, what can I do? He asked me, who are you? And Amalekite answered. Then he said to me, stand here by me and kill me. I am in the throes of death, but I'm still alive. So I stood beside him and killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. And I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. Then David and all the men with them took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan, for the army of the Lord and for the nation of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. David said to the young man who brought him the report, Where are you from? I am a son of a foreigner and a Malachite, he answered. David asked him, Why weren't you afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed. Then David called one of his men and said, go strike him down. So he struck him down and he died. For David had said to him, your blood be on your own head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. So let's pause there for a moment. Does anything sound funny in this story based on perhaps what you've heard in the past? You said you were nodding. What, what were you? That didn't kill him. Is right. So let me go back in, in time here to 1 Samuel chapter 31. Here is the narrate, narrator's telling his story. The narrator says, verse 4, Saul said to the armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. So here's the thing. They're losing the battle, and Saul is wounded, but he's not dead. And he's very concerned about this, because what's going to happen is the Philistines are going to come, and they're going to torture him or, you know, something. And so he wants to die by Israelite hands instead of Philistine hands. But the armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. Saul took his own sword and fell on it. So in other words, he's now attempting suicide on his own. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and the armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. Now, in the passage we read, what we're reading is an Amalekite saying, I killed him. Now, what's going on here? Somebody's lying. You know, it def definitely seems the case. Here's what we think happened, and it starts, first of all, with a bit of irony. So here's the irony. So go back, you don't have to turn to this, but 1 Samuel chapter 15 Samuel the prophet said to Samuel, I am, one, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint uh, you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites 
totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. By the way, this is the kind of thing that Nathan will also talk about in the class of apologetics, trying to understand difficult passages like this. But from the perspective I want you to hear, here's the irony. The Amalekites are still a thorn in the flesh of Israel because Saul never did his job properly. He didn't honor the Lord. And so who comes along just after, now here's the timeline. Saul dies. The armor bearer dies. Now this Amalekite comes and goes, ooh, crown, armband. I'll go to David and I will say, I settled this. Because he's thinking in his mind, oh, David's once Saul dead, you know, because Saul's been hunting him down. So I will show him that I did it. And so what he doesn't know is that although David does not like being chased by Saul, he will never mess with the Lord's anointed. That is the way he's viewed it and he's held it uh, very much. So let me give you an example of that in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 24. Afterward, David was conscious stricken for cutting off a corner of Saul's robe. He's really troubled. He had the chance to kill Saul. He didn't kill him. He cut off a corner of his robe. But even that made him feel guilty. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to strike uh, to attack Saul. Saul left the cave and went the other way. Now, the, the key thing is, this is a big issue for, for David. He feels you don't mess with the Lord's anointed one. What does anointed one mean? Literally, they poured oil on his head and they said, you are going to be the king of Israel. So that's what he means by the anointed one. So when this Amalekite says, I killed Saul, David's like, uh-uh, you're not going to live this. And, and the other thing you must keep in mind with David's anger, what has he just come back from? Anyone remember? Catching up with his family, who the Amalekites had taken. So, Amalekites are not really a warm fuzzy for David right now. They burned his town, they captured his family, and now another Amalekite says, Oh, I ran Saul through. <clears throat> and David's like, Well, you gave your own prophecy of your own death here because this is what's going to happen. So let's just break this passage down. <coughs> yes, wait. If we go on, in the first chapter, in the second verse, it says, On the third day a man arrived from Saul's camp with his, his clothes torn and dust on his head. Yes. Was he faking sorrow? No. No. Um, the sense of that, well, I'll, let, let, me, let me rephrase that. That is possible. But it's also possible that this is so recent, he has just traveled um, from a battle scene from, just to go here, from this area here all the way down to Ziklag. So he's gone about 45 miles or so. Um, and with that in mind, the Malachite, the Malachite, yes. So with that in mind, because um, this is where, just to go back to the map. This is where David is right now when he finds information. This is just after the battle. So it takes a little while to go 50 miles on foot uh, in their world. So he could be covered with dirt and dust just from the trip. But it could be. I mean, Wayne, that's good observation. Because in that culture, the way you show your sorrow is tearing your clothes, putting dust on your head. So that is possible. But... We really don't know. I think most scholars think it's because of just the journey and that he hurried to get there because not much time went by. So it says, David returned from striking down the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. Now, Ziklag is just a smoldering ember right now. The whole place is burned down. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust in his head. When he came to David, he fell on the ground to pay him honor. So they acknowledge who each other is, 
and he says what happened. Now, when he says Mount Gilboa, he is referring to uh, this area right over here. So when he says what happened, that is explaining uh, what happened. And he identifies himself, I am an Amalekite. And again, if you could just get the picture of this, if somebody did something wrong to you and they were of a particular race, and so you are, you're jaded when you look at that particular race now because that person did you wrong and you might make generalizations. Well, David is going to look at this guy skewed anyway on a good day, but with the news that he has is not making him any happy. And this verse 10, and I stood beside him and killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. And I took the crown. Now, this is interesting because it means that he got there after Saul died, but before the Philistines came. Because the Philistines would have robbed this stuff blind. So that is interesting. That he had to be like right in the thick of the battle. Because when the Philistines came, all they got were dead bodies. They didn't get the uh, royal accoutrements that were associated. Now, when David and his men heard this, mind you, they left the battle. They didn't know what happened. This is news. The newspaper has just arrived. And the news is not good. The news is Israel has lost the war. It's very, very sad news. And um, what they do is they mourn. And how do they mourn? Um, it says here they tore their clothes um, and they wept and fasted till evening. And that is a very expressive Middle Eastern way of showing uh, grief or sorrow. Um, and it's, it's genuine. I mean, it is as sad as you can get. Um, I, I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, a modern day equivalent. Uh, Peter, um, trying to remember, Peter Jackson, the guy who did the Lord of the Rings movies, he just released a movie um, which they only showed two days in the month of December. Um, and it was called They Shall Not Die. Um, and the movie was World War I footage that has been totally restored. And they had lip readers read what they were saying and they put words in their mouths and so we could actually hear them talk, because this is before there were talkies, you know, films. And the films are beautifully restored. But what the film does, I, I went to see it, it just brings you into the pain and grief of the war. I mean, it is, you know, devastating. And you had these 15-year-old boys pretending to be 19, who, you know, let's fight for England, you know, that kind of thing. And they, they, they take you with them, getting on the boat, getting into the land, but suddenly they find themselves in the trenches with mustard gas and all this kind of stuff. What the film did effectively was give you the bitterness of war, and particularly, you know, World War I. Um, because for us, it's just a book, it's a war in the history books. You know, we don't really know much about it. And for these guys hearing this news it's it's absolutely devastating you know to hear that we're defeated it's done the philistines have won this war um it's a creepy thing so david continues this conversation he finds out you know he's an amalekite so on and so forth and then he says um weren't you afraid to lift your hand and destroy the lord's anointed yes wilson i got a question about sure First of all, an Amalekite is a non-believer, so how would he know he's the Lord's anointed? That's a great question, and it actually is covered in the commentaries. By the very definition of the word foreigner, um, you are responsible to uphold the law of uh, Israel while you're in Israel. And, and what that means is whether he knows it or not, that's the law. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting story uh, that comes from India. So India was for quite a number of years 
a, a vassal state of England. Um, you may or may not know that. I mean, the whole, when Gandhi, you know, was uh, doing his thing, he was protesting England's occupation of India. But there's a story of that time frame in which, you know, while India was under the British crown, they were technically under British law. So there is a funeral about to take place of a rich man who died. So his body is being brought to the funeral pyre where it will be burned. Does anyone know an unusual Indian custom of the time? It's that you burn his wife with him. In other words, she's alive. And she is put on the funeral pyre with her husband, that they die together. And so the, the British leader, commandant, comp colonel, whatever he was, governor, he says, you can't do that. And the person said, this is our tradition. And don't mess with our tradition. You know, this is the way we do things. To which she said, okay, I won't mess with your tradition. But I let you know, we also have a tradition that we hang people who murder people. <laughs> so when you're done, you'll be hung. <laughs> and the person didn't put the wife in the fire. <laughs> and the point is, there is a higher law, which this other guy did not know, but he was responsible to. But I think in fairness, even if you don't know the law, if you're the one who runs in the head of state and it's only your word that says, oh, he was dying. He asked me to kill him. So I killed him. Now, he's an Amalekite, not a loved community in the people of Israel. I would argue common sense alone might cause him to pause. You know, because if he said, the opposite, and I, you know, I found the bodies, which this would be the truth. I found the bodies, I brought these, and I brought it to you. Um, I thought you should know your king was slain in battle. Now, he could still die because he's the bearer of bad news. I'm just saying he's not using all his brain cells here as far as I can tell. But the truth is we're still responsible for the laws that we don't even know. That is the way the book of Leviticus reads because this is what the definition of a foreigner is. As long as they adhere to the laws of Israel, they may abide in the land. Um, but good question, Wilson. But, but I think actually the earlier um, reasoning makes more sense, you know. Right. So was after David, you know, if I tell him that, hey, he was dying, I, I did him a favor, so it's not like I murdered right. him. I mean, I think he genuinely felt he was going to ingratiate himself to David and that David was going to be, oh, give this man reward, you know, for what he has done. Uh, little did he think that uh, he would be like Saul and Jonathan in a little while. It's also interesting that they, they mourned first. You know, they didn't do this immediately. It's like the first order of business was to mourn. Now comes a poetic section of, of the scripture in which there is genuine mourning. Um, and David is called, in the book of 2 Samuel, the sweet singer of Israel. This is one of the examples of why. The, the, the man is gifted in his poetic skills. So we read the second half of, of this passage. Let me go back to the uh, text here. Uh, hold on a second. Okay, David's lament for Saul and Jonathan. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow it is written in the book of Jashar. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ascalon, lest the, the daughters of the Philistines be glad, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. Mountains of Gilboa, 
May you have neither dew nor rain. May no showers fall on your terrace fields. For there the shield of the mighty was despised, and the shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. From blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan in life, they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was, was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. First thing I want to take note of is that phrase, how the mighty have fallen. Grammatically, we call that an inclusio, meaning the poetry begins with that phrase and it ends with that phrase. So that forms the beginning and end of this poem. Now, going back to verse 17, David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered the people of Judah to be taught this lament. So this becomes curriculum for school. Now, what curriculum is this? The lament, this lament of the bow. Now, why is it called the lament of the bow? Some people think that this was what you had to learn when you learned military craft. So you were practicing your skill on handling a bow, which is Jonathan's instrument, and why would they learn this lament by doing that, while doing that? Because you don't want this ever to happen to Israel ever again. So when you're learning this lament about how Saul died, our king, and Jonathan, his son, the idea is you get good at this bow. And so remember this poem, and may it never, ever happen again to Israel. So that is why they think it's called the lament of the bow, so that there could be a, a distance between this ever happening again. And it says, is it written in the book of Jashar? Now, do you ever read the book of Jashar? No. Ever bump into that anywhere? No. We don't know movie, anything. What was that? I've been waiting for the movie. It hasn't come out yet. Yeah, yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't. Oh. And it probably won't. Um, it shows up only one other time in our Bibles as a reference, and that is Joshua 10, 12. And all it does there is refer to the book of Jashar again. Here's what we think the book of Jashar is. It's a book of, get this, military poetry. In other words, a poetic remembrance of battles. And quite honestly, because there are a lot of poems about battles in the Bible, you could actually fill you know, a small book with the poems of battles. Let me give you an example. David comes back from a tremendous victory against the Philistines. And remember what all the young maidens started singing? Saul has killed his thousands. David is tens of thousands. Or remember when the waters crash down on the Egyptian army and Miriam picks up a tambourine and says, um, does anyone remember that one at all? I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. These are poems of war, and this seems to be one of them. So the speculation is that the book of Jashar is a collection of poems of war. Um, and, and probably that makes some sense. Any of you guys see Saving Private Ryan? The first 30 minutes of that film are gruesome because it's D-Day. It's what's happening on the beach. I mean, it's unspeakable horror. But what the director of that film did, he gives us a feeling, a realistic feeling, of what war is like. And so what they did, they didn't have film to record that, but they had poetry. Because if you're wanting to know what do the soldiers feel like, you read a poem. And it goes both ways, with the triumph and with the devastation. 
And so this is a poem of the devastation. It starts this way, verse 19. A gazelle lays slain on your heights. Now, here's a textual issue you have to wrestle with if you're a translator. Is the word translated gazelle or is it glory? So it could be translated glory lies slain on your heights. Now, why could it be either one? Because the two words are homonyms. Does anyone know what a homonym is? They, they, they're words that are, they sound the same, but have different meanings. And so we have many homonyms in, in English. You know, it's just two words, they're spelled differently, but they're pronounced the same. And so people are like, what are you referring to? Um, I, I mean, this is not a homonym, strictly speaking, but it's an interesting example. The word run. How many meanings are there for run? You can run for president. You can have a run in your stocking. You can uh, run in terms of running a race. And it goes far beyond that. There's like 10 meanings of the word run. But we have words like this in English that are spelled different but mean the same. And so in this particular case, we're not sure which would be the proper uh, word to be put. The translators chose gazelle because it reflects, reflects speed and agility. And so they're thinking that David is saying how someone who is swift of foot and strong is now slain. And it lies slain. Glory doesn't lie. No, it does, but metaphorically it can. Um, it's can metaphorically lie excuse me? slain? If it, it's a poem, glory can yes, lie. It can, yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, translators, you know, they, they, they flip a coin, they put... Well, I shouldn't say they flip a coin, but... <laughs> By the way, one of the fun things I had last week was my professor, uh, Craig Blomberg. He is on the New International Version Translation Committee. So in other words, when they make a decision as to how they're going to translate something, it is his committee that votes on it. There's 15 people on the committee, and some votes are 7 to 8, you know, in terms of it. And so... It was, for me, I was like red meat because I wanted to, I brought, you know, questions to him. Why did you guys translate it this way and not this way? It was, it was fun. And he got energized, you know, in my response. For example, um, I said, why did you remove verse 37 from the New International Version of Acts chapter 8? And, he, you know, so I'm saying, why did you, go, go, if you look in your Bible, Acts 36, skips 37, it goes right to 38. Now, I know the answer, but I wanted to hear what he would say. And he says, hold, hold on, hold on, Steve, hold on. We didn't remove anything, nothing. The King James added what shouldn't have been there. And uh, what, what he was trying to make a case is because people will accuse them of taking verses out of the Bible. And he says, it's the exact opposite. They freely inserted verses that shouldn't have been put in there. And, and the logic is this. The oldest manuscripts we have of the book of Acts don't have that verse in it. But move 800 years later, suddenly this verse shows up. And so he says, you can't put that in. If none of the earlier manuscripts had that verse, then don't put it in. Um, how did I get off in this digression? <laughs> my, my only point is it was a lot of fun talking to a professor and um, asking him these uh, questions about how they come up with translations, you know, that are, you know, the way they are. Um, let's go back to the text. So this phrase in verse 20, tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ascalon. Those are all Philistine communities. And so what he's saying is, I don't want the Philistines, the enemies, to be celebrating this. So in other words, don't let them know that Saul and Jonathan are dead. Um, and then he, he kind of curses the place where it happened. You know, let there be no dew or rain, verse 21, on the area of uh, Gilboa. And then it speaks, you know, again, poetically 
about the shield of Saul um, being despised and, and no longer rubbed with oil, you know, as if it was cared for, because it's no longer being cared for. The owner is gone. And then, uh, verse 22, for the blood uh, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not return back. And so this is a parallel of what's going on with Saul is now with uh, Jonathan's and the sword uh, did not return unsatisfied. Um, then it says, Saul and Jonathan in life were loved and admired in death. They were not parted. Now what's interesting about this phrase of David praising? Has David had a great relationship with Saul? No. So in, in our world, it is as if, you know, uh, let's say Trump dies in office and Obama says, they were loved and admired, <laughs> you know. In other words, when you're thinking of opposites here, but what you see is David had a genuine, deep respect for his king and he had a deep respect for the Lord having anointed Saul king. And so he also loves Jonathan desperately. And Jonathan had a dad. His name was Saul. And so there, there is this connection between them. And so you see kind of an integrity of, of David in even his lament. And then he changes it from the, he doesn't want the daughters of the Philistines lamenting, crying, but he most certainly wants the daughters of Israel to weep. Weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your fine garments with the ornaments of gold. And that means you just had a fine king. And because we had a king, we all benefited, benefited from this. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain in your heights. Now, verse 26 is one of the verses that has been abused on the internet. Um, it reads, Jonathan, my brother, you were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. Mm -hmm. And so you will find all over the internet web pages that say Jonathan and David were gay. <laughs> and that they had, um, you know, that kind of relationship. And that is nothing further than the truth. It's speaking of a deep intimacy of between two people who loved each other very much and were committed to each other. What kind of commitment were they? Um, we have numerous passages, but let me just give you one as an example. Um, and that is uh, chapter 20. Let's see if I can find it. Here we are. Chapter 20 of 1 Samuel. Um, they're talking. And it says, verse 13, But if my father intends to harm you, this is Jonathan speaking, May the Lord deal with Jonathan, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away in peace. May the Lord be with you as he's been with my father, but show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan and David reaffirmed his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. This kind of passage shows up numerous times. And let me, let me ask you, just speaking honestly, do you have a friend in your life like this? Do you have a Jonathan? Do you have a David? I generally have a stereotype that women often do a little bit better at this than men do. Um, it's, it's hard to have a friend like this. You have to work at it. And um, I, I just pause. This is one of those moments where you could say, I can learn from this text. It's a narrative story. But if you cannot say this phrase, you were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. If you have a friend that you could say, I'm that close, wonderful, praise the Lord. And if you don't, I think you should genuinely pray, Lord, give me that kind of friend. You know, I need a friend other than my wife. I love my wife. She's wonderful. I'm glad to have her. And David is married too. 
and he seems to love his wives, as the case may be. Um, but when it comes to somebody of your same gender that you have a close relationship with, you have to work at that. And you know, for me, it's uh, Pastor Jay, who used to work at the church years ago. But um, Jay just texted me last week, hey, you want to have lunch? And I'll text him and say, yeah, let's do it. And we either go to Olive Garden or on the border. We have our places where we go. And we choose to do that. We go to different churches. We have different lives. But we work at keeping that friendship alive. Uh, by the way, one of the funny things of our trip to uh, Denver, and if Nathan was here, I'd be ragging on him right now. <laughs> so we rent a house. Cause it's a seven of us. And it's cheaper to rent a house than to get hotel rooms for everyone. So the, the uh, Airbnb said it had seven beds, and there's seven of us. Now, one of the seven is Leslie. So we know she's getting her own room. You know, that's just the way it is. She's the only woman among us. But it did not have seven beds. It had five beds. Oh. <laughs> and they were king-size beds. So three of them were king-size beds. So Leslie gets one of the king-size beds by herself as a room. But... We guys, we can quickly do the arithmetic. Some of us will be sleeping in the same bed together. And you know, women don't get hung up on this. Guys, not so much. So, um, Pastor Jim and Pastor Jerry got to share one king size bed together. And our brand new pastor, Pastor Henry and Nathan got to share a bed together. And so, uh, when we're joking with each other, all during the trip, you know, people would say, at least I'm not sleeping with another man. You know? so <laughs> we, we'd be going back and forth and back and forth. It wasn't exactly like we were uh, expecting on that. A little more close community than we were, were anticipating. It, it worked okay in the end. What was that? Yes, you do. <laughs> well, it, it was written wrong in the internet, and I'm the one who booked it, so I'm the one who felt bad about it, of course. And, and in fairness, I slept in a rollaway twin cot. Um, you know, the kind you pull from under a bed, um, and uh, it was not super pleasant, but I, if I'm condemning the other guys to be sharing a bed, <laughs> I took the little cot. Um, so, again, it ends with these words, how the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. Now, that phrase is probably referring to Jonathan and, and uh, Saul. They are the weapons of war. So, it uh, refers to them. And so, it's thus that ends. Now comes the change of scenery, which I pointed out on the map. In the course of time... Now, this is interesting because everything major that happens to David begins with this phrase. Now, this is a word search, and I just wanted you to see this. This is Genesis, so ignore that one. But 1 Samuel all the way to 2 Samuel in the course of time, 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 in the course of time. Basically, means time had gone by, but all of these reflect something significant that happened. This is, uh, you might say, what whoever wrote Samuel, this is his introduction to a change of scene. Something big is now uh, taking place. And what is that big thing now taking place? It is that David is deciding to move up into Israel proper. So, you say, in the course of time, David inquired of the Lord. Now that's another thing that I want you to take note of. Because here is another word search. Here are David inquiring of the Lord. David inquired. David inquired. David inquired. David inquired. David inquired. Here's one of these moments where we can learn from this narrative passage. When you're going to do something big in your life, do you inquire of the Lord? Okay. When David inquired of the Lord, it meant probably several things. He fetched one of the priests, and he said, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Could we together go before the Lord and seek his answer? And if you remember, David had the, the priest has his urim and his thummim, these two rocks, one black, one white, and they might ask the Lord that way. 
Sometimes there was an audible sense of what the Lord was saying. But that principle of inquiring of the Lord is something that is in David's life and should be in our life. So how do you inquire of the Lord? Prayer. Prayer. And how do you get an answer? Wait. Okay, what are you waiting for? What happens? Meaning, okay, how do you know your prayer has been answered? The reason I'm, I'm saying this is I want you guys to think through this. That Bible is a, is a wonderful source. Yeah, like, I, I've used this before. Lord, um, I know I'm married, but I really feel like having an affair with this woman. Should I have this affair? I know I can open the book. And the book will say, no, Steve, that would be a bad idea because it's a command, you know. So sometimes the answers are clear and written in Scripture. Other times you have to use wisdom. Like, in, I'll give you an example. In my case, in July of 2002, I received a phone call from somebody at Manhasset Baptist Church. And I'm in Illinois. Would you consider being our pastor at the Manhasset Baptist Church? And I'm thinking, whoa, do I want to move back to Long Island? And I remember a quote that said, better to serve in heaven than to lead in hell. And I was happily serving as an associate pastor. And I yeah. thought, if, if Manhasset Baptist Church is not a good church, yeah, I'll be get to be the senior pastor, but why I want to lead in hell? You know, I, I don't want to do this. And so I needed, so I said, Lord, I need answers. Is this the right church for Steve to go to? And so I started asking questions. And the first question I said, tell me about your church. And they said, well, we have this interim pastor whose name is Jack from Youth for Christ. And I said, Jack Crabtree? And they said, you know him? I said, he was my youth leader when I was in Campus Life. Really? So I said, I'll ask Jack what he thinks of your church and he can tell me. So I called Jack up and Jack says, oh, Steve, it's a great church. You should think of it. You should consider it. I'm like, okay first sign that maybe God is wanting me to do this. Our church in Illinois was in the middle of a building campaign and, and leaving the second most significant pastor at that time of the building campaign, I thought could harm the church. So I said, Lord, I want all nine elders to sign off, every single one of them saying, Steve, this seems like a good thing. So I went to every single elder and all nine of them said, Steve, we feel God is leading you in this direction. Okay, that was our next sign. Then I asked to ask my two older girls. One was 12, one was 10. And one of them, uh, we had moved into our house a couple years before, and they didn't want to move because it meant changing school districts. And every time they went to bed at night, they would pray, and dear Jesus, may our house never ever sell until we die, amen. <laughs> because they didn't want to move. Five miles. And so I said to my girls, what do you think of moving 900 miles? Near grandma and grandpa, you know, that kind of thing. And they both responded in unison, sounds cool, dad. And by the way, you don't hear me mentioning Michelle. I married the most adventurous woman on the world, you know, so maybe not comparing to 600 dives, but uh, um, she was, she's cool with everything. But my point is, I wanted to find, I inquired of the Lord. And what I got were all these answers from different directions. So you're thinking of marrying some guy, you meet some guy in the future, and you know, he's cute, and you know, whatever. But you start asking some friends, and they say, why haven't we never seen him in church? Well, um, uh, he's not very religious or anything. And so the friend says, is he maybe good for you? Um, just because he's cute or, or, or you find out, oh, he goes to church. He's just been unemployed for the last 30 years. He lives with his mother in, in her basement. <laughs> and so yeah. one of your friends says, be careful here, you know, as to what's going on. That is a way you seek the Lord's guidance. So it's the wisdom of friends. It's the, it's circumstances that happen and it's the good old book that tells you, you know, this is right and this is wrong. So you put those things together and you can get the same thing that David does. What should you do? So here is what he said. David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah, meaning downtown Israel, 
And the Lord responds. The Lord said, go up. Where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. It's nice to get a nice specific response like that. Um, and I'll interrupt again. So I'm, when I got married, I'm in New York for a year, and then Amtrak closes the office here and moves me to Illinois. Where do you pick to live when you're moving into a new state? I could live in downtown Chicago, and I thought maybe I should aim for Wheaton. So I move, I, I go to Wheaton, Illinois, which is where the college is, and I just check into a Days Inn hotel. And I'm just saying, Lord, lead me if this is the right town. I turn on the radio, it's set to WMBI, Moody Bible Institute radio, on the, on the t hotel radio. I turn on the TV, it was set to channel 38, which is Christian television in, in Chicago. I go to swim in the pool, and while I'm swimming, a woman is there, and she starts sharing the gospel with me. She was from a church called uh, Calvary Temple in Naperville. I get up in the morning and have breakfast at the Denny's across the street. That person is reading his Bible. That person is reading a book by Charles Swindoll, and that person is reading a book by James Dobson. These are all like Christian writers and things. And I, I was just blown away. And then the Lord kept doing this. I won't go through the whole story, but I said, okay, Lord, we'll settle in Wheaton. <laughs> it was like it gave me that sense that this was the right place. So I take those things not as accidents or, uh, you know, just chance. I think the Lord was leading. Um, I went to the public library to look for a, a hotel, uh, excuse me, a, a, an apartment. And the librarian said that one of the buildings I was looking at didn't have a model to show me. And she said, I go on break in five minutes, I'll show you mine. I, I was like, okay. <laughs> and so we go to her apartment on her break. She shows it. Six months later, we become friends with her. I said, why would you let a stranger, a guy, go with you to your apartment? And she said, when you walked into the library, I felt the Lord say to me, he's with me, help him. <laughs> I look at all those things and I say, yeah, the Lord said to David, go to Hebron. You know, and I don't know how he said it, but it could have been like one of those things that this was the door that was open. So David went up there with his two wives, Anoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal. Her last name is like the widow of Nabal. Whenever we bump into her, it's the widow of Nabal. <laughs> Um, of Carmel, and David took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron and its towns. Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the tribe of Judah. Now, has he been anointed king already? Yes, he has, but it was a private anointing. Now it's a public anointing for part of Israel, Judah, the biggest tribe. So when David was told that the men of Jabesh Gilead who had buried Saul, he sent messengers to them. The Lord bless you for showing kindness to Saul, your master, and by burying him. May the Lord now show your kindness and faithfulness, and I too will show you the same favor because you have done this. Now then, be strong and brave, for Saul, your master, is dead, and the people of Judah have anointed me king over them. Now, you may forget the story, but back in 1 Samuel chapter 11, uh, where we are, here we are. First Samuel chapter 11. There was this crisis that happened. Nahash, the Ammonite, went up against and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh Gilead said, make a treaty with us and we will be subject to you. But Nahash, the Ammonite, replied, I will make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and so bring disgrace on all Israel. So what happened here? Brand new King Saul comes to their rescue. And they never forgot that Saul delivered them. Fast forward, Saul is killed. His body is hung from a city wall. The people of Jabesh Gilead, because they remembered Saul, they went and took his body down and burned it so they could never be disgraced again. And so David, hearing the honor that they gave to Saul, he sends this notice to them, probably for two reasons. One is he's genuinely impressed with their appreciation of Saul. Number two, he is expecting one day to be king over all Israel, 
and he's probably sending this to, to like soften them up because they're right now on the northern part of Israel, which is not kneeling to David just yet. So we're, we're beginning a process of what's taking place. So this next section is bizarre and interesting. War between the houses of David and Saul. Now, do you guys ever hear that Israel had one kingdom and then became two kingdoms? So they're like Saul was king, David was king, Sa uh, uh, Solomon was king, and then the kingdom split. Northern Israel and Judah. What you probably don't know is that was the second time it was a divided kingdom. This is the first time, but it only lasted a couple of years. And so people don't remember this at all. But here's what happened. Meanwhile, Abner, now he was Saul's general, son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Manaim, Manaim, and made him king over Gilead, Ashuri and Jezreel, and also over Eph Ephraim, Ephraim, Benjamin, and all Israel. Now, what you're seeing here is that Saul had one son left. Now, a funny thing about this name is when we look in Chronicles, this is the name that he is given. Ner was the father of Kish. Kish was the father of Saul. Saul was the father of Jonathan, Malki, Shua, Abinadab, and Ishbaal. Now, 2 Samuel has changed his name from Ishbaal to Ishbosheth. And what does Bosheth mean? Man of a shameful thing. The author of Samuel is probably dissing Ish Baal, which would mean uh, man of the Lord, to Ish, man of shame. And so it's just interesting. And now what this is, this is a a weak son of Saul. He is not a strong person, but Abner is. And what he wants to do is have the chance to rule the kingdom through Ish-bosheth. And so Ish-bosheth will be king in name only while Abner rules the roost. So that's the plan. Saul is dead. By, by rights of succession, it would go to one of Saul's sons. So... Uh, let me go back to our text here. And we read, um, he made him king over Gilead, so on and so forth. Verse 10, Ishbosheth, son of Saul, was 40 years old when he became king over Israel, and he reigned, count him, two years. Tribe of Judah, however, remained loyal to David. The length of time David was king over Hebron, over Judah, was seven years, six months. So, when you hear seven years, that's when he was just king, just over Judah. Eventually, he's going to be king over all of Israel. Abner, son of Ner, together with the men of Ipposheth, son of Saul, left Mananim, Mananim and went to Gibeon. Joab, son of uh, Zeruah, and David's men went out to meet them at the pool of Gibeon. Now, basically, we have a civil war in the making. And here's an interesting thing. We have found the Pool of Gibeon. Archaeologists have discovered it. And there it is. Um, it has been unearthed. We know the location. What it is, is uh, a storage pool for water. A cistern. A cistern. And so um, it was unearthed. And so it's kind of cool. You could actually read this in your Bible and visit the actual place where this crazy battle is about to be fought. Now, when I say crazy battle, um, what happened with John, uh, excuse me, Goliath and the Israelites? You remember, the whole point of the battle of Goliath was that whoever wins, wins. In other words, so instead of having your armies kill each other, each side takes their two biggest guys, they fight it out, and then they have their winner. So they decide to do very, something very similar to this. This, to me, is one of the most stupidest battle scenes I've ever seen in the Bible. 
Then verse 14, Abner said to Joab, let us have some of the young men get up and fight hand to hand in front of us. All right, let them do it. So they picked 12 on each side. So they stood up and were counted off 12 men for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and 12 for David. Each man grabbed his opponent by the head and thrust his dagger into his opponent's side, and they all fell together so that the place in Gibeon was called Hekath Hazam, field of the sword edges. That's what it means, field of the sword edges. Just imagine this. Ready, set, go. All, all 24 dropped dead. <laughs> Like, this has got to be the stupidest battle ever. I mean, it just did not work. Um, but that is what, what happened. So verse 17, the battle that day was fierce, and Abner and the Israelites were defeated by David's men. Basically what happens now is the, the armies join in, and they start fighting. The three sons of uh, Zeruah were there, Joab, uh, Abishai, and Ashiel. Now, here comes a little word about Ashiel. So these are Joab's sons. So the general of David, his sons, they were in the battle. Now, Ashiel was fleet-footed as a wild gazelle, and he chased Abner, turning neither to the right nor to the left, and he pursued him, and Abner looked behind him and asked him, Is that you, Ashiel? It is, he answered. Then Abner said to him, Turn aside to the right or to the left. Take on one of the young men, and strip him of his weapons, but Ashiel would not stop chasing him. Again, Abner warned Ashiel, stop chasing me. Why should I strike you down? How could I look at your brother Joab in the face? So here's the problem. Abner really wants to have a, at least a business relationship with Joab. They're, they're opposing generals. But if Abner kills jo, Joab's son, forget it. There's bad blood. But Ashir, Ashiel, is just so, like, he's, like, really quick, and he just will not get off uh, his foot. So, any of you into tailgating, you know, or you know people who tailgate, or you've driven on the LIE, sometimes, if you have a tailgater on your back end, what do you want to do, or what might you do? Slam on the brakes. Yes. Yes. At least tap yes. on the brake. So here's what, Abner is running with his spear and this guy will not, he said, go away, stop following me. Instead, he stops dead in his tracks and the guy who is fleet of foot on his tail impales himself on Joab's spear. It goes right through him, even the back. This is what it reads like. Then Abner, uh, again, Abner warned Ashiel, stop chasing me. Verse 23, but Ashiel refused to give up the pursuit. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Ashiel's stomach, and the spear came out through his back, and he fell and died on the spot. And every man stopped when he came to the place where Ashiel had fallen and died. But Joab and Abishai pursue Abner. As the sun was setting, they came up to the hill of Amah near Gia on the way to the wasteland of Gibeon. Then the men of Benjamin rallied behind Abner. They formed themselves into a group and took their stand on top of a hill. Abner called out to Joab, Must the sword devour forever? Don't you realize that this will end in bitterness? How long before you order your men to stop pursuing their fellow Israelites? And Joab answered, As surely as God lives, if you had not spoken, the men would have continued pursuing them until morning. So Joab blew the trumpet. And what that is, let's stop fighting. That's what the trumpet's for. That shows up several times in the Bible where the trumpet is blown as a signal uh, to stop fighting, not just to gather troops, but to stop fighting. And all the troops came to a halt, and they no longer pursued Israel, nor did they fight anymore. All that night, Abner and his men marched through Arabah, they crossed the Jordan and continued to the morning hours to where they came to Menhanaim. Then Joab stopped pursuing Abner and assembled the whole army. Besides Ashiel, 19 of David's men were found missing. But David's men had killed 360 Benjamites who were with Abner. They took Ashiel and buried them in his father's tomb at Bethlehem. 
Then Joab and his men marched all night and arrived at Hebron by daybreak. So we're going to end here. This is a civil war, is what it comes down to. And it shows you, uh, I'm going to just end by looking at this map one more time uh, here. Let's see. So I want you to just see what's going on. Okay. In this particular map, the, by, the fighting was taking place right around here. So David's men came up here. Here is where uh, Abner's men were. And then they escape over here. Now, why are they escaping way over here? Because of the loss to the Philistines, this land has become all Philistine land. And so this is now the new palace, you might say, is on the other side of the Jordan, far away from the Philistines. And we have begun our journey into the book of 2 Samuel. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege we've had to study your word tonight. A lot of good practical things, such as who is our friend, um, finding strength in the Lord, inquiring of the Lord. Father, in all and through all, we pray that through these narratives, we might learn how best to be followers of you in our own lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for coming.